All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go live here on Facebook. It is pulling up now. And so glad that those of you on the conference call could join. If you could uh, mute your lines, that way we can eliminate any background noise. But we are live now on Facebook, so we'll give folks on Facebook a moment to chime in. Uh, missed getting to have this uh, live conversation with you all last week. I always enjoy seeing uh, the uh, the comments and chat and also hearing those on the conference call. <coughs> but I'm glad that we could get back together and uh, enjoy each other's uh, fellowship virtually and by phone today as well. And, of course, we're all uh, continuing to pray that uh, one day soon we'll all be back together again in person. So uh, good morning, Bradley and Wanda and uh, all those who are on the conference call. I know Sherry and Harold are on. Who else is on the conference call? Paulette. Hey, Paulette. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hey, Doris. There's also uh, Ben. Hey, Ben. Good to see you, brother. And Steve Denzik. Hey, good morning, brother. And Janice. Glad you all could join in this morning. Several others piping in in the um, in the chat there on Facebook. So glad to uh, see you be able to join in this morning with us. Well, this morning we are in Proverbs 29. Uh, we are almost uh, through our study series in the book of Proverbs. Next week will be our last one. And uh, hey, Keith, good morning, brother. And so today we're in Proverbs 29, verses 1 through 3 and 12 through 20. But we're also going to start out this morning in Hebrews chapter 12. So you get a bonus this morning for free. So if you, if you have your Bible, start, let's start this morning with Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to be studying this morning lessons from the woodshed. Those of you who uh, grew up in the country will know what that means. Those of you who don't, I'll explain it to you a little bit more here in just a moment. But when you mention the word discipline, people give you all kinds of reactions. There are many different ideas about what it means to discipline. But many valuable lessons in life, I personally learned what I would call out behind the woodshed. That's time when uh, my parents would discipline me in whatever fashion that discipline took. Back in the day, going to the woodshed meant that you would go out to the woodshed and you would get a spanking of some sort. But uh, it wasn't always a spanking. There were also groundings and other kinds of things that took place. So whatever your discipline means, whether that is grounding, spanking, whatever it happens to be, uh, there is a command that the Bible gives very clearly that parents are to discipline their children. And there are blessings that come from that. We'll also learn in today's study that our Heavenly Father, as the good parent that He is, uh, and the best example that we have of fatherhood, disciplines us because of His love for us. No good parent will not discipline their children. And, Father, and our Father in Heaven is an excellent parent, the best parent we could have, and so He disciplines us when we need it. Whether you spank, ground, time out, or however you discipline your children or your grandchildren, you do it out of love and concern for their character. The main key doctrine that we have here is, is the doctrine of family. Parents are to teach their children spiritual and moral values and are to lead them through consistent lifestyle and example and loving discipline to make choices that are based on biblical truth. And hey, good morning, Barbara and uh, Jerry Ann and Clifton and Esta and uh, Barbara uh, Patterson's on, Joan Murphy, Norman, hey, Norman Linda, many others join us. Thank you all. Boundaries. That's the idea here. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 talks a lot about boundaries. Parents should establish moral and ethical boundaries for their children early in their lives and make those boundaries clear in definition and in reasoning. Doing so makes it likely that the child will humbly submit to parental discipline and will grow up to be an adult of good reputation and of manner. As God has revealed himself to everyone through his creation, he's also established boundaries through conscience. Uh, 
And, you know, the Bible teaches us that God gives all of us a conscience. It is through the way that we live our lives that we either wound or deaden or even sear our consciences. Uh, the, the New Testament talks a lot about how we wound our consciences as adults, as we turn away from good morals and embrace wickedness, and as we turn away from God's leading and God's unction in our lives. But God has revealed himself to everyone through creation, and he's given everyone a conscience. And he's also giving us further definition and further boundaries of what's good and right and moral through his word. Crossing those boundaries requires discipline for our correction. And that discipline is not for our harm, but instead for our good. And as believers, we should humbly welcome discipline for the purpose of holiness and God uses discipline from society, family, and even others to shape his children. Let's take a look this morning at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. If you have your Bible handy or you can open it up in, a, in another browser window there. Or just listen along. Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 7. The Bible tells us, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. If a child is left to itself, that child will grow up to be a selfish tyrant. Anybody know any children like that? Hello? <laughs> and because that child has never learned to subject to authority, that child will never become a useful, mature, respectable adult. But a faithful parent will discipline their child. God's chastening of us is proof that we are his children. Uh, and because of that, all true children of God receive his chastening. And all others who claim to be saved but escape chastening are nothing but counterfeits. Our Heavenly Father corrects us because he wants us to revere him and to obey his will. He even assures us that in our rebellion against his discipline, there is what the New Testament refers to as a sin unto death. 1 John 5, 16, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12 talks about that. The best way that I can describe this is this. Say you took a child into Kroger with you or Walmart or wherever that happens to be, and that child was so unruly and so out of control that you had no other choice but to take that child out of Kroger or out of Walmart and take that child home. That's a good, succinct description of what this sin unto death means. If you're a child of God and you continue to resist God's discipline and rebel against him, and only he knows when that point of no return is crossed, he may go ahead and just take you on out of this world and take you home because you're not responding to discipline. That's the sin unto death. It's important that we learn our lessons, lessons from the woodshed, especially those spiritual ones, that we may fulfill the ministry that God has called us to here on this earth. And every one of us has one. Every one of us has a ministry that we're called to here on this earth. <coughs> but Hebrews 12 also tells us there are some blessed results from God's discipline. Listen to Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 12, 11 through 13. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Going through discipline is not pleasant. It's not something that we all want to go to. 
whether we've done it uh, physically on this earth or whether we're having to go through it spiritually from our Heavenly Father. But there is benefits. And the first benefit we see here is this harvest of righteousness. The rebellion ceased. The child's in a loving fellowship with the father. It's hard to have fellowship with a child that's in rebellion. You still have relationship. That relationship is never broken. But it's hard to have fellowship with a child that's turned away and is in rebellion. So it is with our fellowship with our Heavenly Father. If you're saved, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you are a child of God, and that fact will never change. But your fellowship with the Father can be greatly affected by your rebellion against His will and against the boundaries that He set up for you morally and ethically in your life. There's a warning that's given there in verses 12 through 13. Either, that is, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. How does a child respond to chastening? That child can either despise it or the child can even collapse under it, both of which are wrong. Instead, the child should show reverence to the parent by submitting to their will. And so it is with us on our Heavenly Father using the experiences that we've learned through discipline to strengthen ourselves spiritually and to strengthen us for the work that God has called us to. Get ready. Get set. Go, he's saying. Strengthen your feeble arms and strengthen your weak knees. Get yourself on track and follow the Lord's will for your life. Now let's turn to Proverbs chapter 29, and we're going to look at the goal here of discipline. The goal, Proverbs 29, and we're going to look first of all at verses 1 through 3. Let's look at verse 1 first of all. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Being disciplined doesn't always imply being punished. Granted, uh, growing spiritually as a disciplined believer can be punishing at times, But God does not intend for it to be a form of punishment for us to be disciplined. He wants to render within us a humble willingness to submit ourselves to him. The difficulty with discipline comes when we decide instead to become what the Bible says here, stiff-necked. The idea here is that there is a stubborn mule who will stiffen its neck to resist the bridle. I don't know if anybody out there has ever tried to bridle up a mule or a horse and it stiff necks and resists. And it's difficult to get that animal under subjection in that kind of a situation. Likewise, a stubborn person can refuse to take God's rebukes and God's disciplines as opportunities to be submissive and instead will be stiff necked and rebel against God's leadership in their lives. But God works patiently and lovingly with people so they will yield to him. Stubborn individuals who have rejected his wisdom demonstrate their rebellion against him by constantly ignoring God's correction. The future for such rebellious individuals promises to be devastating. He says here, they will be suddenly destroyed without remedy. Going our own way leads us to certain destruction. Can I get a witness to that? (laughs) I can remember when I, in my life, many times when I have gone my own way and not followed God's will for my life and have wound up in a serious pickle, uh, in a place that I did not want to be and in a situation I did not want to be. Uh, Brother Keith says here, uh, behavior is learned that people mimic their children out from yeah that's true keith that we you can't say a do as i say and not as i do because that doesn't work does it (laughs) thankfully it's the same way with our heavenly father he's given us the perfect role model through his son jesus christ who humbled himself even unto death even the death on the cross Well, ignoring discipline leads to destruction. It also leads to a bad reputation. But those who learn from their mistakes, receive discipline humbly, and are willing to learn from others are respected. Now let's look at verses 2 through 3 here. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. 
A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. There's a bleak outcome for a person who rejects God's discipline. And that stands in extreme contrast to the great and fine-looking optimistic future for God's people who have been made righteous because they place their trust in Him. Those who put their trust in Him and submit humbly to God's discipline will thrive. And as a result, the people and their families and the communities around them rejoice because of it. A person who genuinely genuinely loves the Lord will show it in the way that they treat others. When a wicked person, though, takes over a community or a neighborhood or a city or a kingdom, the outcome is not the same. Instead of rejoicing, the people who live under their shadow find themselves groaning under the predicament of being underneath such a wicked leader or wicked ruler. They're troubled by what's going to happen to them next because they know that those who are in leadership look out for themselves first and not for the best of their employees or their neighbors or their community or their city or their state. The list goes on and on. They lament when they ponder the hazards of living under the rule of a self-absorbed individual who has no concern for them. And in verse 3 here of Proverbs 29, it continues to show the difference between the Lord's discipline and how that discipline changes the life of a believer. They resolve to live in a way that pleases the Lord, and that comes out of a genuine love for the wisdom of God. Do you love the wisdom of God? Do you love God's word? Do you spend time in it and you, when you open it, you say, God, I love your word. Speak to me through your word today. For the, the truth of life and a straight path of life is contained in God's word. His wisdom, his boundaries, his goals for your life can be found in his word. Anyone who rejects the Lord's discipline, anyone who rejects the Lord's leading can expect a heartbreaking fate. Self-indulgence puts them on the path of satisfying their lust. That's why he refers here to a prostitute. This could be any kinds of lust. A companion of prostitutes or pursuing after wealth or pursuing after something else, whatever is your passionate pursuit that takes you away from following God's will and God's way for your life, that is what brings sudden destruction. He talks about squandering wealth. A person may even have riches on this earth, but they squander the riches that they could lay up for themselves in heaven. Jesus said it best, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth cannot eat it and where thieves can't break in and destroy it, where things can't happen to it. For the things that we lay up for us here on earth will definitely perish. So we see there the goal that we can be under God's loving, guiding hand and enjoy the joy unspeakable and full of glory that comes from having the best fellowship that we can have with our Heavenly Father. But then we also see in Proverbs 29 verses 12 through 14, the availability. We're talking about resources here. The availability. Let's start with verses 12 and 13. If a ruler listens to lies... All his officials become wicked. The poor and the oppressors have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. A ruler in the days of Solomon had the power to influence the lives of everyone under his reign. Citizens who lived in his kingdom did not have a voice in their government. They had no other choice but to submit to their ruler's sovereign authority. In such a setting in which complete control rested in one person. The integrity of the ruler made the difference in whether the people underneath his authority would be mistreated or would be treated well. And also the level of his integrity would also be influenced by the advice that he received. If he listened to godly counsel from godly counselors and walked in God's wisdom, he would be encouraged to make decisions that were upright and that were for the good of his people. But if he brought in corrupt advisors who told him lies in his administration, he'd be prone to making bad choices. 
they would lie to him or tell him lies to, to help themselves or to help him strengthen his power in some way. And because of that, corruption would come in and those people would be wicked and the people underneath him would be wicked and wickedness would spread throughout his kingdom. There's a great message in that for us as leaders in our lives today. Are we listening to godly counsel as we lead our homes, as we lead our families, as we lead our neighborhoods, as we lead in our places of business, as whatever leadership position God has put you in? Do we lead under the counsel of godly advisors and in accordance with God's word? Or do we listen to worldly wisdom and we listen to wicked advisors so that we make bad decisions? When we do, we cause those under our leadership to make bad decisions and to walk in the ways of wickedness as well. He goes on in verse 14 to say, if a judge, if a king judges the poor with fairness, if a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. For a king who valued integrity, making righteous judgments would be a priority. But a corrupt ruler would render judgments at issue based on ways that favored only his political allies or in some other way strengthened his power base so that he could hang on to his power and would think nothing of abusing the poor. There's an important lesson here for us as leaders, especially for us as we discipline those under the leadership that God's given us. Do we do it out of anger or do we do it out of spite or we do, do we do it because we have power over them or do we, do we do loving discipline because we have their best interests at heart? I can always remember uh, dad and, and my pa who would, who would discipline, not, not that I was ever disciplined much. <laughs> okay, yeah, we won't go there. But I can always remember him saying, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. I never really understood that until I had to discipline our boys, uh, but I did understand it. When that discipline had to take place, it was just heartbreaking because you don't want to have to see them go through that momentary suffering, whatever it may be, whether it was a spanking or grounding or whatever it happened to be. You don't want to see them suffer, but you know that it's for the good of them to grow up to be godly, respectful and well-respected young men. And thank God we've, we've enjoyed seeing that with all our boys. Praise the Lord for that. It's because of discipline and bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, honoring him and walking in his ways. It's our prayer. Now, there's also another thing that I can say here. You know, you could, there sometimes are people who are good godly parents and still have children that turn out to be heathens. Anybody knows anybody that happens like that? <laughs> That does happen sometimes. All, the best you can do and the very best thing you can do is continue to pray for them and cling to that promise that when you raise a child in the way that they should go, when they're older, they'll not depart from it. Pray that, that God will con convict their hearts and lives, see them turn back around and come back to the way that you train them up. Cling to it as a promise and never cease to pray for them. Well, let's move on now to the responsibility. Proverbs 29, verses 15 through 17. In verse 15, it says, A rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces its mother. When the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your children, and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. There's nothing that brings you more delight in your heart than to have somebody come to you and say, your child is such a good child. They're, they're so respectful and they're such good hard workers and all those kinds of things. To have someone else come and brag to you about your children brings you delight. So it is with our Heavenly Father. When the world looks at Christians and they say, man, I don't know what you can say about all these Christian people. I'll tell you what, they're the best workers I have. I couldn't ask for better workers. They're the best neighbors I have. I couldn't ask for a better neighbor. They're the best friends I have. I couldn't ask for better friends. They're the best brother, sister, mother, father, aunt, uncle. I couldn't ask for anything better. That delights God's heart when people brag on his children. 
So the question we need to ask ourselves is, can those in our sphere of influence, those that God has put in our, in our environment around us, can they brag on us as children of God? And they say they're respectful and they're good people and they do for others and they want people to hear about Jesus. Do they look at us in that way that it brings joy to the heart of our Heavenly Father? He says the righteous will see the downfall of the wicked because even though the wicked may thrive, there is a payday someday. And we know what that means as Christians. And so we should make it our goal above all else, to follow the Lord's will for our lives and tell others while there's still time that Jesus Christ saves lost sinners, that he changes hearts and that he changes lives. There's some things given here in Proverbs about parenting. I'll just run through a couple of these real quickly. In Proverbs 1, 8 through 9, 4, 1 through 4, and 6, 20 through 24, parents give godly instruction to their children. It's our responsibility as parents and grandparents to give godly instruction to our children. Don't leave that to somebody else. Don't leave it to their school. Don't leave it to their church. Don't leave it to their friends. It's our responsibility to ensure that our children have godly instruction. It's nobody else's responsibility but ours. If they get extra instruction out there, fine, but double check it and make sure that it's right instruction. Hello? <laughs> and make sure that we are responsible to see that they're getting the godly instruction that they need. Parents delight in godly children. Proverbs 17, 6, 23, and Proverbs 29 talk about that. What a delight it is to have godly children. Uh, Keith says, you can't force good behavior, be example of godly behavior. That's true, brother. I, I appreciate that input there. Be an example of godly behavior and teach them right and discipline where necessary inside those boundaries. And then in, in Proverbs 3.12, the Bible tells us parents discipline their children as an expression of love. If you love your children, you will discipline them because you know that that's best for them to know their boundaries and to stay within those boundaries. Some parents allow their children to grow up without any discipline at all. And left to themselves, undisciplined children grow up aimlessly. They'll spend the days of their youth in pursuit of foolishness and eventually will be a disgrace, as Proverbs says here, to their mother. We could also say to their father, to their parents, to their families. And the focus of the discipline in verse 16 focuses that a parent's work of disciplining a child can be frustrated by the spread of weakness around them. And it's so true. The community that's around that child can greatly influence them. That's why it's important to ensure that they have good community, that they have good friends, that they have godly friends, that they have godly associations, that we can do what we can while we can to ensure that they're making the right decisions. When they're grown, the people they choose to hang out with, is that's their business. We can pray that they'll make good choices. And if they don't, we continue to pray that they'll see the light and make good choices and hang out with good godly people that will influence their character in the right way. Bad company corrupts good character. That's a proverb that we see here. We've seen it before, and we pray that that would be so. And the smallest thing, Wren says, be good in behavior. That's right. Thank you for sharing that, brother. With this promise comes a challenge to parents in verse 17. God's wisdom at work in a family guides parents to seriously mandate this mandate, discipline your children. It's so important. It requires that we as parents spend quality time with them. You can't discipline a child if you never spend time with them. They're not going to receive that discipline in that way because you know how a child spells love? They spell it like this, T-I-M-E, that's how they spell it. And so if you're not spending that time with them, it's difficult for them to receive that discipline because they don't believe in their heart that it's coming from a place of love. It, it's coming from some other, maybe they think that you are, are trying to exercise power, power over them or some other, in some other fashion. So take the time to study the Bible with them, to spend time playing with them, to spend time talking with them, to, to know about what's going on in their lives, to, so that you can open up those lines of communication and share with each other 
It's so important. Then in Proverbs 29, verses 18 through 20, as we wrap up this morning, we see the source. In verse 18, he says, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Without discipline, people cast off restraint. They have no regard for other people. They have no regard for the property of others. They have no regard for the feelings of others. They cast off restraint and they do whatever they think they need to do to get attention or to act out their frustrations or to get whatever it is that they're trying to get. Without revelation, without God's wisdom, people will cast off restraint. We need to make sure that we not only are in God's word ourselves, but that we're making sure that our children, that our grandchildren, that those around us are in God's word. God's people grow more disciplined as they give their full instruction to his, uh, to his word. And, and we as God's people grow in his will and his way when we give all of our attention to studying his word. We demonstrate that we take it seriously by obeying what he teaches us. And as he reveals spiritual insights to us, we develop this happy, joyful heart that will sustain us through difficult trials of life. We're inspired by what God's doing in our lives, and we look forward to serving him as the highest priority of our life. Listen to verse 19. Servants cannot be corrected by mere words, though they understand they will not respond. This brings up the problem of stubbornness. As followers of Christ, we may hear what he's saying to us, but we may not be willing to conform our lives to keep up with what he's saying. But wise Christians are disciplined to take God's direction seriously. Being disciplined involves nurturing a humble and a willing heart. Such a change of heart enables us to listen to him carefully and to obey him consistently in all areas of our lives. In verse 20, as we wrap up this morning, he says, Do you see someone who speaks in haste? There's more hope for a fool than for him. God's word furnishes us with a need to be wise in him and to apply our wisdom. Uh, to apply the, our wisdom that we develop in listening to God to our daily lives. The proverb in this verse points to an obstacle that prevents us from receiving his word. And that obstacle is this. We cannot listen to God when we're unable to be quiet. That's why we so often call our time with God a quiet time. It's important to be quiet long enough to listen. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody who won't be quiet long enough for you to say something to them? Anybody? <laughs> you, uh, it seems like they're just waiting for a chance to say whatever it is they have to say, and then whenever you start speaking, they're just looking for the next pause to jump back in there and say something rather than actually listening to what you have to say. How often is it that we approach God in the same fashion? Instead of just stopping for a moment, instead of being quiet, as the psalmist tells us, be still and know that I'm God. We are all so, so busy and so, so anxious that we don't stop and be quiet long enough to actually listen to what God has to say to us. It's important that we stop and we listen. For in verse 20, he says, there are more hope for a fool than for the one who speaks in haste. God's revelation is the standard for discipline. Words alone do not constitute wisdom, but actions on those words are required. The person who heeds instruction and discipline avoids the folly, he said, the foolishness of acting with haste. Consider the goal. Know your resources. Remember your responsibility and look to the source. Embrace God's discipline and the principles of applying loving discipline to those under your authority in life and so reap a harvest of righteousness to the glory of God. Thank you so much for joining today. I pray that God will bless this word to your heart 
And I'm so glad to be able to see those who were able to join us by Facebook and those who were able to come by conference call. God bless you. Don't forget to tune in to the service that starts at 11. Pray for Pastor Mike as he brings the message for Sugar and Sam and the rest of the band and all those uh, in, our, in our media team as they uh, lead in worship this morning as well. God bless you and have a great rest of your day and a blessed week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.